Excuse me, Professor, I don't know if you can hear me, but we can't hear you on Zoom. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Don't ask me why it wanted to be rebooted, but it did. This stuff never works. That's not true. It mostly works. Um, okay, let me back up and uh, reiterate what I was saying. So again, ultimately, Clausius Clapeyron only um, is telling you what the vapor pressure of a liquid is as a function of temperature, right? And so, you know, to some extent, that's a question of the moistness of the atmosphere in a container. We talked a little bit Wednesday about how that might relate to the idea of humidity. Right, where it um, merges with our discussions of phases is the fact that the definition of boiling is where the vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. Right, what we think of as normal boiling point is really boiling point where the pressure is one atmosphere. And the reason one atmosphere was chosen is because that is standard pressure at sea level. Right, air pressure actually decreases with altitude. You know, it doesn't really matter if you go up two flights of stairs, mind you. Right, there's technically, if you had an infinite number of significant digits 
slightly less air pressure at the top of a building than the bottom of a building, but it's nothing really measurable. On the other hand, if you go to Denver, Colorado, which is 6,000 feet above sea level, there's a noticeably lower air pressure. And if you go to the top of Mount Everest, which is the highest land peak on the planet, you actually have a significantly lower normal atmospheric pressure. The average atmospheric pressure on the top of Everest is about 0.64 atmospheres, right? This is why people summiting often wear oxygen, right? Because you only have really two thirds of the atmospheric pressure, which means really two thirds the amount of oxygen, All right? As a result, you boil at a different temperature, right? Because fundamentally, right, boiling is determined by vapor pressure. And now I don't need my vapor pressure to get as high. And so, right, it's really a vapor pressure issue but for the phase change that merges with atmospheric pressure. So it's Clausius Clapeyron, right? And again, what I do know is the normal boiling point of water is 100 degrees C. That is the vapor pressure, right? Being equal to one atmosphere, the vapor pressure being equal to one atmosphere when the temperature is 100 degrees C. That gives me one reference point. Hi, Professor, we've lost you again on Zoom. So how's everyone doing? Welcome to class. I'm your teacher, Owen Wong. I am now the host of the Zoom for the second time this semester. Let's go, Owen. Uh, today we're talking about vapor pressure and let me pull up the email to see what else we're talking about because I wasn't paying that much attention. Oh yes, solutions, solutions. Good At class. this point, class. you should just pull up pull up the slideshow and start going through it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Give me a few. Someone minutes. screen share it.
I am going to leave my face off, hopefully to spare bandwidth. So I'm not quite sure when the people at home got cut off. So again, um, the the one and the two really are just referencing the temperature. So it's the vapor pressure at that temperature. So at 100 degrees C, the vapor pressure is one atmosphere. That's the definition of normal boiling point. I'm trying to find the boiling point at 0.64 atmospheres. So that again is where the vapor pressure is going to equal the new atmospheric pressure. Um, delta H is delta H and R is R. At this point, it's largely a plug and chug. The, um, the only thing I would say, and I have grossly exaggerated here, is because of the, the natural log, don't over round it, right? I really don't need five or six sig figs here, but you know, some people have a tendency to try to round them to all, all the time. Whenever there's a log and therefore an exponential involved, I kind of like to keep an extra sig fig around. Um, And so if I plug and chug, there's a little bit of algebra there. Again, the complementary function to the natural log is the exponential. And so, um, although I don't need it here, sorry, everything is just not working. But um, so log of a number is just a number. Again, be a little careful with the, uh, um, fraction math, All right? So this is just a number. I've got one over key two there. So I'm distributing this across, which gives me a number. Or excuse me, I divided this over here, which gives me now this number minus this. Isolate the one over T2, invert it. I'm still in Kelvins. I get 361.77 Kelvins, which is 88.6 degrees C. All right, so again, always ask yourself, right, or someone close to you, does that make sense? Well, my answer is yes, because again, the atmospheric pressure decre decreased, so I should need a lower vapor pressure to boil, and so a lower temperature should be required because I don't need to get the vapor pressure up as high. Right. From a very practical standpoint, if you're not just into phase changes because you like phase changes, right, it makes it harder to cook at atmosphere. Right. Any cooking you do, which involves water, which is most cooking, right, at least most stovetop cooking, right, water boils at 88.6 degrees C. So if you want to boil something, whether you're making super pasta or whatever, because the temperature is lower, it's going to take longer to cook. Again, the flip side of this, if you're not strictly, you know, interested in just boiling something in the open, right, it also does tell you what you could reduce, right, or increase the pressure to to change the boiling point. The other sort of practical kitchen application of this is a pressure cooker, right? Pressure cookers cook faster really not so much because of the pressure, because again, pressure only really affects gases. And unless you have a gas-based diet, right, your food isn't very sensitive to the pressure, but if you increase the pressure, water boils at a higher temperature. So in a pressure cooker, you can get the temperature of the water higher than 100 degrees C, which decreases um, the cooking time. Right. And of course, the side of this is 
if you want to boil water at zero degrees C, and who doesn't, right? If you just decrease the pressure enough to where the vapor pressures become equal um, to the atmospheric pressure at whatever temperature, it will boil, right? And so really the implications of this um, of Clausius Clapeyron beyond simple phase change issues, right, involve the fact that it allows me um, to dry things at lower um, temperatures by simply um, changing the pressure. Um, and this is a common way of drying something that might itself be temperature sensitive. So if I were to, for example, synthesize um, a drug or any other commercial compound that itself is temperature dependent, right? Meaning that if I heat it up, it will decompose, right? If I need to dry it, I can't heat it to dry it. So instead, I hook it up to a vacuum pump and I decrease the pressure so that um, the liquid I'm trying to remove boils at a reduced temperature. That's really weird. Okay, questions on that, anything? Before I switch gears on you completely. It's quiet in here, it's quiet in the chat. All right. Again, the phase changes are great. It's a real honest to goodness physical process. It does matter. I mean, you know, at the very least, if I'm trying to do some kind of reaction and I want to stir it, I need to be at a temperature where I'm a liquid, right? So there are practical implications to what melting points and boiling points are, right? Most of our discussion is really around, you know, the theoretical underpinnings of why they are what they are, right? But there are practical implications to that. But usually from a chemical standpoint, I'm not trying to change phase for the sake of changing phase, right? Most of the chemistry I do tends to be either in the liquid or the gas phase because solids are hard to stir, right? And that is, something of a temperature phenomenon. This thing is really annoying me. I can't get rid of it. Sorry, I don't think you can see it at home, but we've got another technical glitch in the room, so. Clearly, Freeze Fest hates chemistry or something. Now it's temporarily gone. It'll come back at any time. Um, anyway, so. Um, typically, I do my reactions in either the gas phase or the liquid phase. So, you know, again, I might have to consider temperature if I'm trying to get into the appropriate phase, right? 
And while there are legitimately important gas phase reactions, the production of ammonia being probably the most notable example, right? Most reactions industrially tend to be in liquid phase, right? For a couple of really practical reasons. One, the whole reason gases and liquids are my preferred phase is because I can stir them, right? But the nice thing about liquids, which isn't true about gases, is that they have a fairly high thermal mass, right? Which means if my reaction is exothermic or endothermic, I have a way of dissipating, right? The heat or supplying further heat if it's endothermic to keep the reaction temperature more constant. Gas phase reactions don't have much thermal mass. So if you do an exothermic gas phase reaction, it gets really hot really fast. Right, and so there's a lot of reasons to do things in liquids. Um, that's true whether you're talking about organic chemistry or inorganic chemistry. We are mostly about the inorganic chemistry in gen chem. And for us, it's usually water, that's the solvent, right? But I, since I will mostly be talking about water, that's my inorganic bias. But what we're saying here also really applies to organic solvents and organic chemistry, right? And again, solutions have a fundamental intermolecular force picture, right? But it's different than my phase changes for pure substances because solutions inherently are mixtures, right? By definition, a solution is a mixture of a solvent and at least one solute, you could have multiple solutes, right? And so I have intermolecular forces, but I have multiple intermolecular forces. It's not just water to water, it's also water to solute, and it's also solute to solute, right? So first of all, right, simply making the solution involves energy changes because of the intermolecular force changes that are required to make it happen. If I've got sugar and water, which I've drawn here as essentially pink hexagon, other than the pink, water is kind of hexagonal, right? And there's good old water drawn as green ovals, right? If I'm going to actually make a mixture of those two different substances, I actually have to separate at least some of the water molecules, probably not all of them because most solutions, the solvent, right, is far more plentiful than the solute, right? And I also have to separate all of the sugar molecules, right? My sugar is a solid at room temperature. They're all stuck together. So if I'm gonna mix them, I have to separate them from each other to get them mixed into the water. Otherwise, all I've got is a lump of solid at the bottom of a beaker of water. When I mix them, I also now develop new forces, right? Because now I have the intermolecular force of attraction between the solute and the solvent, which didn't exist before, right? And so essentially there are three sets of intermolecular forces involved in making a solution, right? They're represented here as enthalpy changes because that is the chemical way we talk about energy changes, right? And so there's the solute-solute interactions, which have to be overcome, right? I'm moving the water molecules apart to stick the sugar in there. I'm moving the sugars apart to stick them in the water. There's the delta H of the solvent, right? Which again is pulling apart the water molecules. And then when I mix them, I've got this new water-sugar interaction, right? By the nature of the fact that they're all attractive forces, right? Two of those processes require me to put in energy, right? I have to separate the molecules and molecules all like each other. But then I do get energy back when the sugar, if you will, sticks to the water. Right. Again, it's not sticking in sort of a solid phase sort of way, but there's now a new force of attraction, 
right? Which manifests itself as a stabilizing force for the mixture. And so I essentially have two endothermic processes where I had to separate, break the intermolecular forces between the solute, solute, and the solvent, solvent molecules. And then I have this endothermic, or excuse me, exothermic process where I've now mixed the water with the sugar, right? And so from a sign standpoint, endothermic enthalpy changes are always positive. A little traumatic flashback to chem one, right? Exothermic processes always have negative delta H's. That's what defines it as exothermic, right? In a generic sense, I can't say anything specific about the overall sign because it's going to depend on what the relative value of each of those delta H's is. For some solutes and solvents, the total of all the endothermic processes is greater than the exothermic processes. For other solute solvent mixtures, the opposite's true. And so my net delta H could be positive or negative, All right? And this is a way to make a very simple hot pack or cold pack, right? In some cases, like if you mix sodium hydroxide and water, which is not a good commercial hot pack, by the way, because it also dissolves your skin. But if you've ever done this in the lab when you're doing an acid base lab, if you put sodium hydroxide in water, it gets really hot, right? That's because in that case, the delta H of mixing, right, is bigger than the sum total of the delta H's of the solute and solvent. So if this is small, right, and this is big, it's a small positive number plus a big negative number, the overall ends up being exothermic, and so it feels hot to you. Right. Other things work the other way. And so you could, in fact, create a cold pack in the same way. If you take a solute, right, that when it dissolves has an overall endothermic process, it will feel cold to you. Right. But we will come back, I was hoping later today, but if not later today, on Monday, to this basic picture, right? Only back to the context of phase changes, right? For the actual mixture. As you might guess, right? The fact that I now have a different set of intermolecular forces because I'm a mixture actually changes the melting point and boiling point, right? Because I have a different set of energies I need to overcome. And so my three key points here, this is not the most important 10 slides of the semester, but it just sets us up for what we're talking about either later today or next week, right? The overall energy of the system, right, is related partly to the intermolecular forces, right? I cannot, right, completely ignore the fact right, that there's also the temperature issue, which is a big part of the energy of many systems, right? But then the intermolecular forces also play a critical role, right? For a solution by definition, because there are two or more molecules, right, I now have multiple types of interaction, right? If I just, I'm talking about water, as we have been for most of the week, Right, all I've got are water-water interactions, right? So it's just hydrogen bonding and van der Waals forces of water. If I've got sugar in water, now I might have a hydrogen bond dipole. There is a dipole on sugar, right? I've got van der Waals between the sugar molecules and van der Waals between the sugars and the waters. And so I now have all these mixed forces, right? And the big issue, at least for the rest of today, right, because they're mixtures, they're not unique, right? By which I mean, I can put a little bit of sugar in the water or I could put a lot of sugar in the water, right? And so the sum total of all of my intermolecular forces 
is going to be different if I have different no amounts of the molecules in the system. Right? And so the rest of this particular presentation is actually redundant with the start of this other presentation. So for those of you playing the home game with the slides, I'm switching over, but it's just reproduced in both places. Oh, I hate you. Sorry for the people at home. They probably made no sense whatsoever. <laughs> you know? um, but it's I've got this weird pop up that keeps popping up. And it's temporarily gone again, right? And so, right, because my mixtures are not unique, I can have different amounts of solute, right? Another flashback to good old Chem 1, right? If I have a solution, I can't simply refer to it as sugar water. I mean, I can, but I'm not telling you enough to do anything useful, right? I need to tell you what the relative amount of sugar and water is, right? And in a word, that's concentration. And there are a lot of different units of concentration, all of which fundamentally are trying to say the same thing. What is the relative amount of solute relative to the total amount of the solution, right? And so in many ways, probably the best going to say that even though you might argue the best unit of concentration is probably percent by mass all right i say that because as i frequently say mass is the easiest thing to measure accurately all right and so what could be simpler or better than throwing something on a scale all right and from an engineering standpoint that is probably the most commonly used unit of concentration right and as you can see, it's just a measure of the amount of solute, in this case, specifically grams, relative to the total amount of solution, All right? Because it's a percent, you know, it's technically out of 100 grams, but it's really just, you know, grams of sugar, right, over total grams of water plus grams of sugar. And so it's really easy if you have a scale to make up a solution based on percent by mass because you just weigh everything and then mix it together. All right, for some things, you know, volume, if you have two liquids you're mixing, right, volume not so hard to measure either. And so percent by volume is really the same thing, how much solute relative to the total amount of solution, but instead of weighing everything, I measured its volume. All right, this is common if you have two liquids. All right, you could still weigh them, and I still want to say my bias is towards weighing because it's more accurate. Part of the problem with volume is it's temperature dependent, whereas mass is not. Right, but this is not uncommon if you have two liquids. In fact, you know, happy freeze fest, if you have 90 proof vodka. Right, this is actually 45% by volume, meaning there's 45 milliliters of ethanol, right, per 100 milliliters of vodka. And that's because at room temperature, ethanol and water, which is most of what's the rest of the um, 55% of vodka, right? The water and the ethanol are both liquids. All right. 
You could also use mole percent, and we will. This, of course, anytime there's moles involved, so my three circled ones here are really largely chemically specific units because as chemists, we love moles, moles, moles. Engineers, physicists, biologists, not as fond of moles. And some applications biologists are, but right, really moles is very much a chemical specific unit. And from fall, and really for most of spring, our favorite unit of concentration because it's the most directly chemical is molarity. Because that directly tells me how many moles of solute, which is probably the thing I'm reacting, right, exist in a certain liter of solution. And so again, since my solution is aqueous, right, it's very easy to measure volume. Right. Molality, which is unfortunately only one, de one letter different than molarity, right, is my least favorite unit up here for a very practical reason. Um, it actually tells you the moles of solute per kilogram of solvent, emphasis on solvent. You'll notice all my other units up here and if I threw up another dozen concentration units, because there are many, many different units of concentration you could use, they're all solute over total amount of stuff, right? Solute over solution, right? The solution includes both the solute and the solvent, right? That to me, and maybe to you, makes the most sense because if I have a mixture, it's mixed, right? And so having the total amount of solution on the bottom, right, means, you know, if I wanna know how many grams of salt are in my salt water, well, if I have the percent by mass, I just weigh my sample, right? Multiply it by the percent by mass and I have the grams. If it's a liquid and I have the molarity, I just measure the volume of the whole thing, multiply it by the molarity, and I know how many moles of stuff there are, right? Molality is a little awkward. It's asking me to measure the solute and the solvent separately, right? Which is actually easy to do if I'm mixing it, but it's a little more complicated if I already have it mixed. Right, because any measurement I do on the mixture is gonna be a measure of the total amount of everything. All right. And so I wouldn't even mention molality. I hate it just that much, except it is relevant to our next topic, which is at least the first half of next week, um, which is colligative properties, which is virtually the only place you ever see it get used. All right, and so again, with the exception of molality, right, all my units of concentration are equivalent and quite frankly convertible, right, to each other because my numerators are all some measure of the amount of solute, my denominators are all some measure of the amount of the solution, right, so if I've got grams over grams, I can easily get moles over moles, that's molar mass. If I got grams over grams, I can easily get liters over liters, that's a density conversion, right? In fact, by some combination of density and molar mass, you can pretty much interchange all of the ones I showed you, all right? From a chemistry standpoint, again, molarity is our favorite and going forward, it's the one we'll use most frequently. So, you know, make friends with it. The most common confusion here with molarity, right? is that it's usually written as big M, right? And people sometimes want to interpret that as moles rather than molarity, right? And so, you know, it's a compound unit, right? It has 
both moles and liters in it always. It's a ratio between the moles of solute and the liters of solution. Right. And so if I got a graduated cylinder and I know the molarity, I can easily figure out how much moles of stuff I have. And as we get ready to actually go back to doing chemical reactions, it's always the moles, moles, moles that matter. Right. Again, percent by mass, probably the easiest because I can weigh everything. Right. If I want to convert them, and this is a case where I need to use really both of my conversions, right? It's always numerator to numerator and denominator to denominator, right? Because this is a case where, again, the more information you can squeeze into your units, the better. If I write that as grams per 100 grams, it's not clear what the grams are of. If I write this as moles per liter, it's not immediately obvious what it's moles of and what it's liters of, all right? And so specifying moles of sugar per liter of solution makes it clearer. And if you think of it that way, then, right, the conversion only makes sense to go from the solute to the solute, right? Because different measures on sugar are easy. Turning sugar into wine more complicated, right? And the same with the total of the solution, right? And so essentially, right, I wanna convert grams of the solute to moles of the solute. And then I wanna um, convert grams of the solution to liters of the solution, right? And so if I wanna go from grams to moles or moles to grams, that's a molar mass issue. Right. And if I want to go from grams to liters, right, which is a unit of mass going to a unit of volume, that's a density issue. The molar mass is easy. If you have a periodic table, look it up. Right. The density is not always easy. Right. Because in a very real sense, density is not a material property. I mean, it is, except it's very condition dependent, right? Densities depend on temperature, right? Because of course, volume is length times width times height, right? materials expand and contract as the temperature changes, which means their volume increases or decreases as the temperature changes, right? The mass is constant, the volume is not. And so right off the bat, if I'm talking about water or aluminum or pick your favorite compound, I can look up a density, right? But the density is gonna be very temperature dependent. And, you know, again, because my standard conditions are usually 25 degrees Celsius, right, it's really easy to find the density of something at 25 degrees. But if I'm doing my reaction at 50 degrees, especially if it's a somewhat less common material than water, it may not be so easy to find the density at a different temperature or excuse me, the, the, yeah, the density at different temperature, all right? The other problem with density in this particular context is it's concentration dependent, right? This is a mixture. If I have pure water and it's a 25 degrees C, I'm okay. If I have salt water at 25 degrees C, it's not the same as water. I mean, it might be if there's barely any salt in there, but you know, there's a fun game you can play to, you know, amaze young children and possibly adults, right? If you take hot water and salt, you can dissolve two cups of salt in one cup of water without it spilling, right? Because when you mix a solute into a solvent, 
the volumes don't add, right? And they have different densities. To begin with, right? I mean, salt does not have the same density as water. All right, as a result, density ends up in this context being both temperature dependent and concentration dependent. All right, the only reason I bring this up because this is one of the things which I think is sort of a life skill and, you know, keep Siri from taking over the world. All right, because there's not necessarily a perfect solution to my problem, all right? If I have the exact density of my exact concentration at exactly the right temperature, this is easy, all right? So if I have 1.2 molar sodium chloride and I want the percent by mass and everything's at 25 degrees C and I know because somebody measured it that the density of 1.2 molar sodium chloride is 1.08 grams per milliliter, Right, my conversion's fairly simple. Right, I've got sodium chloride on the numerator in both cases. I want to go from moles to grams. That's a molar mass issue. Right, and so that half converts me to what I want. Right, I now have grams of sodium chloride in the numerator. If I want to convert the denominator, Right, I have liters, I want grams, that's a density issue. And so 1.08 grams per milliliter will get me there. I do have to get to milliliters. And I do have to get to 100 grams eventually. But one liter is 1,000 milliliters, and then my 1.08 grams per milliliter gets me to grams. And so that's grams of sodium chloride per gram of solution, right. and voila, I have percent by mass. From a practical standpoint, it's usually not that easy, because really, what are the odds? You know, sodium chloride is actually pretty easy. There's a whole website dedicated to it, the Salt Institute. I don't know whose money that was and why they funded a salt institute. But if you go to, I think it's saltinstitute.org, they've got thousands upon thousands of data points related to salt and salt solutions. I'm not even kidding. So pick any temperature you want and any concentration you want, you can probably find it for sodium chloride. For sugar, not so much. I'm not aware of any sugar institute. All right. If I thought I could get a grant to do it, I might become the Sugar Institute. And so more normally, the data I find around density of solutions is spotty, right? And so I only bring this up because this requires me to make a judgment and this will pop up during the course of the semester. Here I have a 2.5 molar solution of sodium chloride. I wanna do the same thing, except when I go to the, inf and this is because I'm ignoring the saltinstitute.org because <laughs> again, for sodium chloride, I could probably find it. But when I go to the internet or my reference tables, I only find the density of solutions, right? Around 2.5, I don't exactly have it for 2.5. And of course, there's also the possibility of the temperature issue. And so, you know, this is a real life human problem where I have to decide how to make this work. If I really, really, really need 2.5 molar, you know, and maybe it's 2.5000 molar, and I need all five sig figs, I'm gonna have to go to the lab and measure the density myself. All right, I, I weigh it, I measure the volume very accurately, that gives me the density very accurately. If I'm trying to use existing data, I really have three options. And they differ in terms of really the number of sig figs, right? My two options that give me the most sig figs is either pick the number close enough, right? You can see it's not changing that much as I go from one to two to three, or from one to three to five, right? So three is pretty close to two and a half. That probably gives me two sig figs. 
if you look, all three of those densities I have are 1.1 to two sig figs. If I need a third sig fig, I can do what's known as a linear interpolation. And so maybe we'll pick that up on Monday because I don't want to run any further into freeze fest, right? But this is one of the things that makes people most uncomfortable because everybody wants science to be exact and everybody wants there to be an exact answer. And a lot of times here I have to deal with the inexact. Um, and we'll delve into that more on Monday. If you have questions or problems, see me. Um, if not, have a good weekend. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor.